Hello, everybody. Kenichiwa, Watashiwa, Grahamadas. Hello, Diagwit, Graham Dabaras Anamdom. Hello, everybody. Graham Dabaras is my name. I am the CEO of Bitcart, and I'm also a member of the expert committee on the Nomad Institute. My talk today will be on technological sovereignty, Bitcoin, and human dignity. Um, seeing as we're here situated in Osaka, in particular the Osaka Bay and the port, for what is essentially a human rights convention, I thought it was pretty apt that people start talking about the human rights situation here in, in Osaka. If you don't recognize this statue, this was erected in San Francisco in 2017, which represents a Chinese teenage girl, a Philippines girl, and a Korean girl. Due to the 200,000 enslaved women that were taken and captive by Japanese during World War II. The Osaka mayor doesn't seem to think that uh, this is uh, the reality, but I thought it was necessary to share this with you in the context of presenting here in Japan. So what is technological sovereignty? Just to break it down for you, we're talking generally about freedom from outside interference, whether this is as a member state or as an individual. Bitcoin, which we all know and love, is globally accessible, indiscriminate, and irrefutable. And this can also be synonymous with human dignity, or human rights, which is universal, inalienable, and unconditional. So colonialism, or pre-colonialism, kind of looked a little bit like this on the left, where generally Great Britain, Portugal, etc., would uh, take land captive uh, to produce products or spices and export them back home. Well, today we've basically gone into a digital colonialism, uh, which revolves around economic and media. Um, and we know this through, you know, debt. That's essentially what the West are imposing on other countries. So it's a form of US hegemony. How do we protect ourselves from this? Well, we use open source technology, number one. Uh, Bitcoin serves as a potentiality for a more humane approach to digital rights, duties, and privileges. Um, and there's already countries today that have mandated this in their laws that their public administration will only use open source technology. This includes Venezuela, Russia, and Cuba, due to obvious reasons. So I come from the Republic of Ireland, where um, we are a very neighbor, or neighboring country, Great Britain. Um, August is Tirgon Tonga Tirgon Anam. And that roughly translates to a country without a language is a country without an identity. And despite a hundred year revolution where we have an independent free state in Ireland, I notice how I am speaking in English, uh, in English language, which I am actually an Irish native. My number one language is Irish, and yet 90% of my population speak English, they watch English movies, they listen to English uh, music, and they support English, tele uh, English uh, soccer teams. Every Saturday they go to Manchester or Liverpool or London to support a team where they actually have this in their own country. So you can kind of see this as an indirect colonialism, which is, uh, which is prevalent in many, many countries today. So how, you know, how do we serve to protect people with Bitcoin? Well, we're doing this with our product, Bitcart, and it serves as an alternative economy in countries like Venezuela, where people are able to actually trade in gift cards using Bitcoin and Bitcoin Lightning and live on these products and this currency as an alternative to the Venezuelan Boulevard, for example. So someone on my website can earn in Venezuela in an hour, five or ten dollars, which is the equivalent of 30 days uh, salary for the average person in Venezuela. So there's many teenagers and young adults who are actually earning more money um, with Bitcoin and Bitcoin Lightning than their, their predecessors and their, and their, and their superiors. Um, so I would encourage you to maybe check this out. Uh, it's called Bitcart, bitcart.io. And um, yeah, I guess that's kind of it for me. If, um, if anybody wants to obviously look at this website, please check it out. But also in, in, in general, I think Bitcoin is, uh, is, is a very, very powerful tool and that's why we're here to use it. Um, so yeah, that's all for me. I don't really have much time. Um, so hopefully you come meet me afterwards and you come chat to me. You can notice me in the Irish Jersey. So uh, yeah, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your time in the lovely, beautiful city of Osaka. Hello, everyone. My name is Dusan Kovacic, and I'm from Rockaway Blockchain. Today, I will talk about governance of decentralized protocol, 
I mean, as there is certain schizophrenia about the needs for the governments during its uh, life cycle. So in the early stages, the protocol is bootstrapped by the founders and basically all the resources, including the team, the roadmap are allocated and controlled by the founder. However, as the protocol becomes more mature and people become dependent on it, suddenly the features of being centralized, fast, flexible, becomes unwanted. I mean, nobody really wants to lock in their future on a platform that is actually controlled by a bunch of guys in a very non-transparent fashion. So before we go further, let's ask ourselves a very important question. Is decentralization the number one problem to be solved at this moment in the space? Definitely not. However, can the protocol succeed in the long run? I mean, success in a way that it will be used in a business critical systems. And I also think it's not possible. So, I mean, looking at the current length landscape of, of project, and I'm an investor, so I see a lot of uh, platforms being created. We ex expect, I mean, the project expect that the transformation from centralization to decentralization will somehow happen. However, usually it's not really the, the case. So, I mean, again, looking a bit at, the, at the history, figuring out on the way doesn't really work. I mean, whatever foundation you can, you can put into the slide and it would actually apply. So how can it be actually done? What can we do to the proper transformation from the centralized stage to the decentralized one? And I think it's really important before we come into the details to understand various uh, actors in the ecosystem and basically start the process as 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 it as first of the users get onboarded into the platform because before that it's it's perfectly fine if the protocol is in the central stage being controlled by the founders investors support them core developers have the same incentive to basically make it success however when the users start being onboarded and build prototypes on top of the platform unless it is becoming decentralized in it, its governance, they will not be incentivized to switch to the production state. So what are the key takeaways from here? I would say take decentralization as a process. It's not a state, it's a process, and in, implement it into your projects as a, as a work stream that can be regularly checked on. Uh, for a business to switch to a protocol, it has to have certain confidence that it will be here tomorrow, it will not change, so the, the, he can rely on and be confident locking the future with this platform. Uh, check out Aragon, check out DAO stack. I really think these tools can be implemented to govern the protocol in the later stage. Thanks very much, and have a good day. Hi, hi, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Bobby. I'm the co-founder of CoinGecko. Uh, topic on presentation today is uh, is market cap an objective measure of crypto assets value. So yeah, uh, a little bit about CoinGecko. For those of you who do not know what we do, we are a crypto data aggregator. We track price, market cap, trading volume for over 5,300 coins, over 380 exchanges. We are on the top two, uh, top 10 largest crypto websites in the world. We have an API that's used by MyTerwallet, Etherscan, MetaMask, Trezor. Uh, every quarter we publish a crypto report. Today we just published a Q3 report. You can check it out on our Twitter at CoinGecko. So, based on my topic, um, is market cap an objective measure of crypto assets value? One of the things that we have learned from running CoinGecko in the past five years is that anything that gets measured gets manipulated, and everyone's out there trying to manipulate things. So don't believe everything that you see or read on the internet, and, and especially on crypto sites. Um, I guess the question to ask is, how do we end up in this situation? Why is everything uh, that gets measured gets manipulated? So I guess. The answer is pretty simple. Uh, I call this a fake it till you make it theory. Um, everyone's got an objective. You run a coin, you have a market cap, you want to be the you want to be known as the token that has the largest crypt, uh, the best to, crypt, the best, to be the best crypto token. And one of the ways that people measure crypto assets at this point in time is uh, using market cap. So everybody wants to be known as the token which has the largest market cap and they would, what they do is they try to do all they can do to manipulate their data. And when they have a large market cap token, uh, we get some positive media attention, and then some people will start researching about these crypto assets, and then some people start believing that this 
token. It's actually reliable and big and all. And then some people start putting in orders, and then sooner or later, perception becomes reality, and this becomes a self-fulfilling virtual cycle. So I guess the question that we should take a look is, how is market cap calculated? So if you take at traditional market, if you look at traditional markets, market cap is pretty standardized. It's basically price multiplied by shares outstanding. And in traditional market, shares are only traded on usually one exchange. And, and the shares outstanding are defined as basically all the shares that have been distributed, uh, that is attributed to shareholders, including shares held by, restricted shares held by company insiders. Now, if we use the same concept in crypt, uh, cryptocurrencies, then token market cap equals token price multiplied by token supply, which is actually a very questionable metric to begin with, but let's just kind of stretch it and let's see. So how do we calculate token market cap? So price is basically uh, relatively simple. Uh, tokens are traded across many exchanges. You take the volume multiplied by the average price across all exchanges and the supply. Now this is becomes hard. How do we actually measure the supply? Everyone uses circulating supply, but how do we actually calculate supply? So let's say if you're a crypto asset token team and you want to manipulate your market cap. Now let's try to give our asset a very high market cap. So based on this formula, token price times token supply, so there's a couple of things that people do to manipulate the supply. And we have seen this happening many times in our work at CoinGecko. So a lot of these guys try to come up with uh, a token which have a large upfront supply. And um, what they do is they do uh, pre-mine, they insta-mine them, and then do you include or exclude them from the circulating supply? And that's a debate that a lot of people go through. What about tokens that have been issued to company, teams, investors token? Do you include them or do you exclude them? Uh, arguably, you can say that Tokens that are held by the company are restricted tokens and are therefore like treasury shares, which should not be included. included. Uh, what about tokens that have been issued to team? The team, uh, if it's locked or not locked, which, which, which token should you include in the supply? And all these things makes a big difference to the market cap. And what about airdrop tokens? If you create a token with a lot of, uh, a lot of tokens and just airdrop them, like you guys all have Ethereum wallets and you know on, your, on Etherscan you get like random ERC20 like being distributed to you, like all this dust. Do you count them as, as, as circulating supply? But nobody really uses them, right? But from the team, they say, I've airdropped these tokens to everyone. Everyone who has Ethereum address have these tokens. So it gets calculated in the circulating supply as well. Uh, what about lost tokens? For example, like by, by some measures, like Bitcoin has two to three million tokens that have been lost. Do you include Satoshi's coins, for example, in the circulating supply? And I guess the biggest one of all is uh, fork tokens. Um, Bitcoin has Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin SV, Ethereum has Ethereum Classic. It's very easy to fork a coin these days, but do you include the tokens that have never been claimed? At the moment, a lot of measures of market cap includes all these tokens that have never been claimed. And actually, the hardest thing is, how do you even know which, uh, which coins have been claimed and which have not been claimed at all? So let's reverse some of the numbers. There are many ways how you can manipulate numbers. Uh, go out there, try to figure out a lot of websites claims they have the circulating supply. We try to be as transparent as we can. We put the methods. So this is an example of 0x. Uh, we take a total supply minus all those tokens that are locked, but go out there and try to find, and it's really hard to try to reverse engineer all these numbers from all the crypt, uh, crypto aggregators out there in the market. Qu question is, are there any other valuation metrics besides market cap then? I guess some things that you should take a look to consider is uh, network value to transaction uh, ratio, the NVT ratio popularized by Chris Berninsky. So take a market cap and then divide it against the number of transactions because you may have a very high market cap but no transactions going around. You may want to take a look at developer activity, take a look at how many commits, how many pull requests, how many stars, how much activity is going on at development. Uh, take a look at no total number of transactions. Are there any transactions going around? Any realized cap? And maybe for exchange-based token, you might want to take a look at any DCF model to take a look at cash flow basis. So yeah, uh, basically that's all I have today. So um, thank you very much. Anything that gets measured gets manipulated. Thank you. What's up, DevCon? How you doing? Yes. Thank you. Honestly, uh, to start off, just want to say thank you for choosing my talk to come to. Realize you guys have a lot of options. Might not be the most sophisticated talk, but hopefully the most entertaining. Uh, quick shout out, Alchemy fam. Love you guys. All right. So I'm not going to be talking about my divorce, unfortunately, for one of my coworkers who gave me that little tip. But uh, we'll, be, we'll be talking about how uh, in school, you know, you learn about how going through um, different types of elements when you're thinking through uh, things that are important to you. So like separation of church and state. And then now with cryptocurrencies, how it's possible to separate uh, state and money, right? So 
let's go through it real quick. So give you an overview of what I'm gonna ramble about. Uh, start off with a little historical context about why it was important to separate church and state. And then provide a little per of perspective and finish up with uh, the crypto anthem. All right, so quick survey of the room. Don't be shy, who has paper money in their wallets? Show of hands. I knew it, no coiners. Full of no coiners. Oh, I still love you guys though. All right, let's be serious now. All right, so why was there a need to separate church and state, right? Right, why was there a need? Because life is super complex, right? I'm trying to figure it out all the time. People need a good framework. Uh, there's a lot of purpose in life that you need some guidance on, right? So it made sense. Why would you leave something so, I guess, crucial and important as an individual and give that to kind of a central authority like the government to decide for you, right? So can we uh, apply that same logic to money, right? I would think so. So just think about it. Money affects every aspect of your life. Who you date, what kind of food you eat, what kind of health care you get. I mean, pretty much just about every facet of your life. So why would you let someone else choose the type of money that you can use when literally anything that happens to you is based on how much money you have and what you can do about that through that money? And our current financial system, what is it based on? Faith. That's not good, right? Let's go through that. All right. So uh, basically, like, the person telling you that the faith of your value of the dollar is based on the, world, the word of Donald Trump. It's not a very good word. But uh, so, like, each unit of account in our current system represents debt, right? Um, so that is a promise to pay back someone else down the line in the future, right? And you have like the US government, President Donald Trump saying like, listen, the dollar will be worth something one day and you'll be able to pay back that debt. I don't feel too good about that. So um, in short, Ethereum has created a path forward, right? Um, you guys know this, it creates a distributed system where uh, things are immutable um, it's just a perfect environment for you guys to have self-sovereign money separate from any central authority to kind of control that for you. Um, and that's basically about it. Hey, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm here to talk about DeFi, risk, um, and how we can make participants make better decisions. So I'm Jack. I'm an engineer at Consensus. Uh, I've been working on DeFi before it was called DeFi. I love DeFi because I've always been interested in computer science and finance, and as a longtime DeFi user, I've, I've got to see how much the industry has grown and matured over the last two years. And when I think about the future of DeFi, I get both excited and worried. As we know, DeFi users are chasing the highest rates without asking, why are the rates so high? There is no such thing as a free lunch. For an investor to be rewarded with high rates, they have to take on large amounts of risk. As DeFi grows, how do we ensure that users are encouraged to make optimal financial decisions? I couldn't find an answer to that question, so I tried to answer it myself by creating the DeFi score, an open source, simple proxy for a platform's risk level that users can easily understand. It's based on a model that evaluates several types of risk that are common in DeFi. DeFi platforms are complex and include new types of risk that differ from traditional financial markets. To launch, we'll consider some of the largest and most easily quantifiable risks. The intention of this score is to better educate users on the unique nuances of smart contract-enabled financial markets. This model can and should grow over time. Let's dig into some components of the score. One component is smart contract risk. The ecosystem knows this type of risk all too well. We've learned a lot of hard lessons because of it. While no smart contract can be guaranteed to be devoid of bugs, a thorough co code audit and formal verification process from a reputable security firm helps uncover critical high severity bugs that could result in financial harm to users. An important aspect of mi mitigating smart contract hacks is ensuring the code is auditable, auditable by the public. 
Smart contract code isn't trustless unless the public can read it and verify it. It needs to be open sourced. Security through obscurity offers weak guarantees at best, and at worst results in delays in finding critical bugs. While bytecode decompilation is possible, it's a difficult and time-consuming process and makes it hard to follow the mantra of don't trust, verify. However, code risk is only one aspect of the risks one faces when investing in DeFi products. Financial risk is another element. Sorry. Currently, the only method to mitigate unwanted amounts of credit risk in DeFi is to use over-collateralization. While current DeFi platforms use very conservative collateral factors, the highly volatile nature of crypto assets means that these high collateral factors may still be insufficient. Over-collateralization is by no means foolproof. Liquidity and insolvency crises often go hand in hand. There are numerous historical examples of these types of crises. Incentivized liquidity does not mean guaranteed liquidity. A user takes on the risk that they will not be able to draw their asset, withdraw their assets on demand because all the assets are currently lent out. But wait, there's more. There are other types of risk that DeFi platforms face. Users do not have the same safeguards they have with traditional deposit accounts. Developed countries' bank deposit accounts are regulated and insured up to large amounts. However, there are exciting developments in this area. Insurance products like Nexus Mutual, Yuma and Maker are developing more collusion-resistant Oracle systems, but we still have a long way to go. Here are some of the possible, here are some of the possible future developments for the DeFi score. The question I'm here to ask you today is, what could an open source financial rating agency look like? The future of DeFi is really exciting. If you're not involved yet, you're missing out. The parallel financial system is reaching escape velocity. We can hedge away a lot of this risk, but we need to be aware of these risks first. Let's be responsible when creating this new system. If you want to help shape the future of risk management, please get involved. Here are some of the ways to get involved. We want feedback. If you're a data scientist or a risk management professional, please reach out. Thank you. The compilation, it's for geeks, right? Uh, like when you think about decompiled contracts, we think, oh, like what's the use of that for other people than developers who want to see how contracts work? But really, there is a lot of cool uses and I want to show them to you uh, in five minutes. So one thing, of course, security. And I don't know if there are any security people here, but Quickly, anyone can spot a bug here in this contract? Like some people analyze Solidity contracts, try to figure out what's wrong there. Anyone? No? Okay, perhaps it's just a quiet audience or perhaps no one sees that there is this small assert at the end. It doesn't have the brackets, which means that uh, like compiler only shows, you know, it's like saying assert instead of calling an assert, so it doesn't get executed. So, so this function doesn't work really, it doesn't check anything, anyone can print any amount of tokens from, from that contract. And you know, it's very hard to spot in Solidity, but when you work with decompiled sources, you really see certain patterns very obviously. And there is this intermediate form that also is available uh, that, uh, that you can work with and write very simple and very easy analyzers for contracts. And this is also awesome because, well, I built a whole database of all the contracts on the mainnet, decompiled, I put it in the BigQuery, and now anyone can write in five lines of JavaScript a function that in 20 seconds will show you all the contracts that are messed up. So just line by line, contract by contract, all the hundreds of contracts that don't check certain values properly, and you can print tokens for yourself. So, so that's like a fun case. Uh, like, don't worry, all of those contracts were test contracts aside from five, and those five were already exploited, and there are some like horror stories that people didn't notice uh, that, that they could be exploited. So, so there are no other open vulnerabilities like this, but having access to decompiled versions of contracts really allows you to do all kinds of fun security analysis and trying to figure out what's going on on the network. Uh, another case was, oh yeah, so that's this contract. Uh, there was a Constantinople fork, and the question was, we're changing the virtual machine. 
and there is a potential bug in some of the contracts that happens because of the change. How do we know which contracts could be affected by the new version? And in January, when there was this, uh, this whole, whole fork that was delayed, um, actually this kind of stuff, the decompiled version was used to figure out how many contracts on the main net would be affected by some changes in the virtual machine. So this is super important for the community. But again, this is geeky stuff a little bit. Uh, so there is more and it's more user facing. For example, a very simple thing that you can do and we did that during one of the hackathons is uh, analyzing who, are, who has the access rights to a contract. So you grab a contract and you can analyze the sources and figure out, oh, this storage contains the address of the administrator, and this administrator can be changed in this, this, and this function. Or this contract has some other, like, five administrators, and they can be accessed by this and that. So there is this simple tool that we wrote and open sourced during one of the hackathons that allows you to see the, yeah, like, all the, all the possible actors that are involved with the contract. You could also use this to really build better user interfaces. And this is where we really get to the users, user part of view, because when you can analyze contracts better, you can understand them, you can build a better user interface. There are blockchain explorers who don't show sources for many contracts just yet. And when we have good decompiled version, we can show that to the users. So that's also quite cool because that kind of levels ground be between other blockchain explorers which didn't have sources because they didn't want to, to, to get them from Etherscan and, and Etherscan. And one more, more cool thing, <coughs> transactions. Like many users right now, there is no good way to show to the users how transactions work. Really, like this is the state of the art, I guess, uh, Etherscan right now. So it shows you only like input data. You, you can see that on the bottom, it says transfer function, some parameters, and that's it. But when we have access to the decompiled versions of the contracts, for any contract, for any transaction, we can show it quite nicely how and what every function does. So actually there is this version online uh, right now that we build it on top of that, uh, on, to on top of those sources that shows you not only what was transferred, the amount of money that was transferred, but what is being used, uh, like what are the functions that are called, what do they do? And it's still not super accessible to the uh, common user, but it is quite easy. So roughly that's it. There are many more use cases, but check out, uh, check out the compilers in general and look into the field more. Uh, it's quite an awesome stuff. Thank you.